So in our study of the letters of Paul to the Thessalonians, we find ourselves in 2 Thessalonians 2. We have found that in these letters, these very early letters of Paul, um, written to the Christians at Thessalonica, with whom he had only spent three weeks uh, after sharing the gospel in that city, starting in the synagogue and then moving out uh, from that to include Gentiles who were interested in what was happening in the synagogue and, and so on. And the gospel began to spread among them, and then he had to leave. But he wrote these letters back to them to address various matters. And it's so interesting that matters of the coming of the Lord and the coming of the day of the Lord were, were of first order importance. And it's interesting because there are a lot of people today who think that these matters are some kind of peripheral. They're, they're debatable issues that are really of no consequence. We need to just get on with matters of the Christian life that, 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 that are not so mysterious and esoteric, but not so with Paul. This is actually central to our identity as Christians and how we conduct our lives in this time, because we are looking forward to the coming of the Lord, and the coming of the Lord is the coming of the day of the Lord, and so it's important to understand that, and Paul wrote these letters um, explaining that, and in the second letter, Paul was having to address a rumor that the day of the Lord had already come, that it's already here, and he's saying, no, it's, it's not here, and he begins to iterate what it would look like if it were here. And a key uh, feature of the presence of the day of the Lord is the presence of this person whom he calls the man of lawlessness. We began our focused study on this individual last week, and we are continuing that today. Can we hear okay? Okay, is that better? All right. So here we are in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 12, the man of the lawlessness in the tribulation. And just as a quick review, and this is the part A on your outline that uh, we've given to you. This is what we covered last week. We looked at the revelation of the man of lawlessness, how he will be revealed. And that uh, happens with the beginning of the day of the Lord. Notice that Paul speaks of the mystery of lawlessness that's in the world right now. That's our present condition. That has been the situation since the days of Paul, since the time when Jesus ascended up until today. Uh, the, the current scene is one in which evil is present in various forms. I like the... Uh, description that Isaiah gives in uh, one of the chapters in Isaiah, he speaks of, of um, wickedness and evil like a ro rolling sea that churns up the, the mud and so on. It just kind of, and, and so as we go through time, it rolls and manifests itself in various ways. And this he calls the mystery of lawlessness. But there is something which he calls a restrainer. There is, he speaks of it both uh, objectively and subjectively. It's, there is something that is restraining. There is someone who is restraining. And he doesn't give a lot of detail and we don't actually know exactly what he was referring to, but there are some good suggestions as to what that is. And the two best suggestions that have come in the history of Christian interpretation of this is that it involves both the presence of the church in our witness as light in the world, but also through political power. Paul speaks of this in Romans 13. And, uh, as a restrainer of, of uh, evil and wickedness. Uh, so in some sense, this together works here. 
Uh, and we're going to come back to that at the end of our time and, and make some comments of this. Anyway, Paul says that at some point, this restrainer is removed. Uh, the restraint comes off. And out of the mystery of lawlessness then emerges this one who is called the lawless one. His coming, uh, Paul describes this. Uh, on your outline, you see the text there, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12, and in verses 9 to 11, those verses right at the end of the text that's printed on your handout uh, is where he talks about the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. It comes with a deception, and then there is a judgment of delusion from God uh, because they refused to believe the truth. So the lawless one uh, is revealed, and the revelation of the lawless one is the beginning of the sequence of the day of the Lord. We're now looking at this part of that sequence. We're taking our time because there are a lot of things to talk about here, and I've kind of made a promise that I, I want to try to be not so uh, verbose and give a little more time <laughs> for, for questionings and so on. So uh, we're going to try to do that today. So I'm just going to focus right here to understand what Paul is saying when he talks about this one who's been revealed and uh, now proclaims himself God in the temple. You see in your outline that uh, part B there, it says temple enthronement and self-deification. <clears throat> the texts that are sources, old, the Old Testament texts that Paul is drawing upon, that we draw upon when we talk about the Antichrist, these texts coming out of Daniel especially, talk about something that happens at, a, at the midpoint of Daniel's seven-year pattern. Daniel 9 talks about a seven-year pattern of trouble, of tribulation. And that's why you hear uh, prophecy teachers and, and others talk about the seven-year tribulation. But Daniel also speaks of something that happens in the middle of that. And that's why I put down here, there's a midpoint crisis in the tribulation. And that is background for what Paul's talking about here. So if you want to just look, let me just point out a few verses here in Daniel. Uh, in, in Daniel uh, 8, you'll see there, uh, Daniel 8, 9 to 14, and 23 to 26, this is uh, one of the texts dealing with this person whom we refer to as the Antichrist, this coming ruler. Now, remember, when you're in Daniel, you're dealing with a typology. Uh, Daniel's texts uh, have reference to somebody who, who came in the second century BC. Uh, it was a king of Syria by the name of Antiochus. History calls him Antiochus Epiphanes because of his uh, self-exaltation and so on. And this guy uh, desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. However, he forms a type of someone else who's coming in the future. And so these passages in Daniel have reference to both. You'll find sometimes the language seems to be very, very clear. It's talking about this person who did this in the second century BC as we're looking back in time, but the language becomes hyperbolic at least, okay? Or it's moving it, uh, beyond that past historical event to the, the future type, okay, or future antitype. So here, uh, let me just point out a few verses. I won't, we won't look at all that's on your handout, but in, in Daniel 8, uh, is in verse 13, 
He says, uh, then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored. 2,300 meanings of evenings and mornings. Okay, so evenings and morning, evening and morning is two, but evening and morning makes one day. So you take the 2,300 and you divide it by two, all right? And uh, so you get, uh, what is that, 1150 uh, there, or, or uh, yeah, 1150, 11, yeah, 50. You know, it's been too long. <laughs> Uh, too long in theology, that's the problem. I guess. And, you know, there was a day. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the point is that it's pretty much the same, pretty close to what the other numbers are that we're going to see here in Daniel. So if you just go down that chapter to verses 23 to 26, and we have a description of this person who's doing this for 2,300 evenings and mornings. And it says, at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. It's very interesting because, you know, Paul talks about this one comes with the power of Satan. Daniel says he will be great, but not with his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. Paul talked about deception. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes and shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been told is true. That's the 2300 evenings and mornings. So this person is doing this especially for this period of time. Now, <clears throat> to go over to Daniel 9, verse 27, it says, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one seven. That's translated one week in most of your translations, but it's one period of seven units. And for half of the seven, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So that's what Daniel 8 said, the vision concerning the burnt offering and the transgression that makes desolate, and giving over the sanctuary of the host. So here in Daniel 9, 27, he shall put an end to the sacrifice and to the offering for half of the seven. Well, half of the seven is three and a half. And, um, and that's going to come out in days, roughly equivalent to what we saw there in Daniel 8. In Daniel 11, let's turn over. Uh, Daniel 11 has a lot to say about this person, but we'll just look down here to verse 31. And it says, uh, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering." And they shall set up the abomination that makes it desolate. Now, um, verse 36, and the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. And then we come down to chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince, this charge of your people shall arise. There will be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation until now. 
down to verse seven. And it says uh, right in the middle of that verse, um, it will be for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half. Uh, that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things will be finished. And then down to verse 11. And from the time the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes it desolate is set up, there shall be 1290 days. Blessed is the one who waits and arrives at the 1335 days. The point to be made here is we're dealing with approximately equal amount of time. And what this is indicating is a crisis, some kind of a crisis, and it involves the temple. And this is where Daniel uses the word, the abomination of desolation. He talks about the cessation of the sacrificial system. The sacrifices are going out of the temple and they're, they're, they cease. It's been profaned, so it cannot, it cannot be offered. And, um, and it all involves this person. <clears throat> Now that's what we get from Daniel. So if we go to Jesus' comments, just uh, very quickly, Matthew 24, 15, where he says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then it's time to get out of Jerusalem. Uh, the point to be made here in Matthew 24, 15 is Jesus speaks of the abomination that Daniel spoke about. Okay, so there's the connection. But then we move over to Mark, Mark 13, uh, verse 14, and where we have Mark's version of, of Jesus' comments. And he says here, Mark 13, 14, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be. And that's different. It's, it's in Daniel, it's an abomination that this person causes to happen. It's a thing. It's, it's something he does. But uh, here Jesus speaks of the abomination, and the, the abomination is a person, <clears throat> he. And the standing is a masculine participle there, he standing there where he doesn't belong. So he is the abomination of desolation. Well, uh, we come then to Paul's... Um, comments here where Paul says, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God and object of worship. He's quoting Daniel eleven thirty six 36 there. And then he says this, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, Paul is the clearest on this of all the texts that we've been reading. Paul is very clear, this is what happens. He enthrones himself in the temple and he self-deifies, he, he proclaims himself to be God. I think we just need to note what Paul is saying here and how unique this is uh, in history. Think, for example, of those who have profaned the temple in the past. You know, you remember when our, in our study in Chronicles, we read about um, uh, the, uh, the king, um, uh, Uriah, who, who came into the temple and uh, to, to offer sacrifice. He was going to do it. Uh, himself as the king. This is what the pagan kings did. They offered it themselves, but this was not allowed by the law of Moses. Only the priest could do this. And the high priest uh, was telling him to get out, 
Now, he didn't go in the Holy of Holies, but, you know, he was in the holy place, and go into the most inner sanctuary, but you can't even go into the holy place. You can't go into the, the, um, the, the outer chamber within the temple building. Only priests can go in there. And so here he was coming in there, and it says immediately, God struck him with lepers. And, uh, and he, you know, it, it shocked him. The priest saw it immediately, and they hurried him out to save his life, and he was a leper for the rest of his life. Um, not involving the temple, but you think of Nebuchadnezzar, for example, in Daniel uh, 4, when Nebuchadnezzar was talking about all the wonders that he, by his own power, had, had done. And, um, and there was a message from God to him that he would be humbled as a result of that, and, and his mind was taken. And so he was, he was crazy. He was insane for seven years. And then all of a sudden his mind was restored and he gave glory to the God of heaven. The, the temple site, here's the point to be made, the temple site in, in Zion. Uh, scripture says God has chosen. That's, that's holy. And uh, it's not to be profaned. In, we, we also read in Chronicles other kings that placed idols in the temples. And um, they all came under judgment. Every one of them came under judgment. Now, some, it was quickly, and some, you know, it, it endured for a while. But they all came under judgment. But nobody in the history of Scripture has ever done this. Nobody has gone in there and declared themselves to be God. Now, notice that when you put all this together, what Paul is saying together with what Jesus was saying, together with what Daniel is saying, this causes uh, sacrifices to cease. Now, remember in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews points out as arguing to the Jewish people that they need to put their faith in Jesus because there has been a change of priesthood. And there are people who are relying upon the temple sacrificial system as an atonement system. And the writer of Hebrews is arguing that that has been that has been replaced. That a sacrifice has been has been given that eliminates the animal sacrifices for sin. So, from the argument in the book of Hebrews, there is somebody who's caused the sacrificial system to end to cease. And it's Jesus. How did he do that? He died an atoning death. And he rose again with, as, as Hebrews says, with a life that ever lives. He has an indestructible life. But he offered himself, his own blood, as the atoning sacrifice. That is what caused the sin sacrifice system of the temple to cease. Now, what we have here is an antichrist, you see, who is, who is, who is described as causing the sacrificial system to cease because he is God. Now, he doesn't just claim to be a God, according to this. He doesn't just claim to be, well, you know, there is no God. There's just the best of humanity, and I'm the best of that. As Paul is describing, this guy places himself there and claims to be 
the God. He is God incarnate. And notice that in the book of Revelation, he, he appears to have died and to have risen again. But it's a fraud. He has this mortal wound from which he seems to have recovered. So he appears here as an anti-Christ, claims to be God, having the authority of God, and declares the cessation of a temple service. So the thing to notice here is how unique this is in the, the, the history, unique in history. Everything we know about temple service that has happened in Jerusalem from antiquity uh, moving uh, into the future. Notice that we also have, we are talking about a temple setting. Uh, there are some things about the Antichrist that can you know, when you read about them, they're, they're said rather generally. And in general description, people's minds work and they think, well, this could be that. We talk about a person who causes war to break out of the earth. Well, there have been a lot of people who've done that. <coughs> you know, and somebody doing that now, you know. And, uh, and when we go back a few decades, there were great candidates for, you know, a person who might fit this bill. But see, we can, with a general description like that, our minds can work and we can think, well, maybe this is it or maybe that or so on. This is something very specific. This is something very specific. This is not a metaphor. And some people have tried to suggest that. Well, you know, the church is the, is the new temple. You know, the, we're the body of Christ. So maybe this is somebody who who is somehow in the church subverting. No, we're not talking about that. Paul is writing at the time when the temple is standing in Jerusalem, and he's referring to the temple, okay? And he's talking about this person um, profaning that temple with his presence in self deification and he's quoting Daniel, and Daniel is talking about an actual temple building and a temple structure and, um, and, and, and uh, sacrificial service going on. So <clears throat> it's important to note that in the day of the Lord, there is a, in the tribulation period, there is a functioning temple in Jerusalem. We're not talking about a temple built somewhere else, but we are talking about a temple there. In that place. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of people very interested in this, expecting that there will be a temple in the tribulation. If you go to Jerusalem today, you can actually visit a museum of a uh, future temple. There is an organization that is dedicated to producing the implements uh, that would be used in the future temple. You can see them on display, some that have been produced there. And there are, uh, some of the Jews speak about the future temple. They want to build that temple. And there are a number of evangelical Christians who are very excited about this, uh, it, because when you see that, you, you're seeing literal prophecy coming to, to fulfillment, You're, what the Bible talked about actually happening. And we live in an age in which people, you know, do not believe scripture. They don't take it as literally true. And so whenever you see literal prophecy in scripture coming to realization, it's, there's a certain encouragement there of the truthfulness of God's word. However, what we've got to hasten to remind ourselves is that um, what's being talked about here is not something that's authorized. 
by God. It's very clear in this. Uh, we've, we've seen this a couple of times in some of our studies, but in 2 Samuel 7, <clears throat> when the prophecy was made to David regarding his son, the Lord said that he will build a house for me. There's only the, the authority to build the temple is in the house of David. And that's why when you come to the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, it was a very important thing that the prophets are pointing out that Zerubbabel had the authority to build that temple because he was a Davidite. He was of the house of David. Uh, that, that doesn't belong to Israel generally. Nobody has authority to build that except somebody in the house of David. And we already know who the Christ is, who is the son of David, and consequently the authority to build the, a house <laughs> for God is his. Uh, I remember asking some people some uh, one time when <clears throat> this discussion was going on, how, how do Jewish people today who talk about the building of the temple, how do they think that's authorized? And the answer is, well, they just think they have the authority to do that. I mean, what is the authority of the, of the Talmud? What is the authority of Jewish law? Well, we just have the authority to do that. So there's going to be some temple building, and there's going to. And so some people ask, well, if that happens, if they start building that today, does that mean we're in the tribulation? No. It does not mean we're in it yet. The tribulation sequence doesn't begin with the building of the temple, it begins with the appearance of this person. And during his activity, that building was already there or comes to be there, either way. Okay. And by the midpoint of that activity, it's there, and he's there, and he's doing this. That's what scripture is saying. So <clears throat> there's a temple setting. Now, some people say, no, isn't there a temple in the millennial kingdom? Yeah. And who builds that? That would be the Lord who comes back. Well, why do we have that? I mean, he did away with all the sacrifices, and he did away, according to Hebrews, with the sacrifices for sin. But there's other kinds of sacrifices. We call them barbecue. <laughs> they're, 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 it's a festival, you know, so there's this these festivals, and there are prophecies of the kingdom where the nations are. I mean, it's one big festival. <laughs> so we don't want to get into that. The point is that, yeah, there, there is a kind of temple because the Lord himself incarnate, and where is he going to be? There. Notice how this person is an anti-Christ. Because the Lord himself will appear, as Haggai said, suddenly in his temple. Okay. But that's not this. This is great deception. Contribution of the book of Revelation. I'm just going to mention this and then stop, okay, because I think you have comments and questions, and there's a lot to say here. And maybe we'll just start there next week. But the point to be made when you take a glance here in Revelation 13, 1 to 10, and 11 to 18, that whole chapter is speaking about this that we've been talking about. That whole chapter is talking about this person whom John calls the beast and what he's doing there and how worship is focused upon him. And it introduces another character, a false prophet, who's like, a, he's like an Elijah, false Elijah who turns, Malachi said Elijah comes to turn the hearts of the people to the fathers. This, this person turns the hearts 
of people idolatrously toward this antichrist and uh, cause them to worship, and then adds the economic aspect to it, that the control of the economy is around this person. Revelation 17 to 18 talks about a coup, a, a military and political coup that takes place in order for this person to emerge in power. And that appears to be taking place at the crisis point, the same crisis point in the middle of this tribulation. Well, maybe we'll talk about that a little more next week. I want to come down to the point, what's the application to the day? And I want to come back to the restrainer. Okay, where did, where did we go here? So, um, so participating in the present day restraint. Remember he said the mystery of lawlessness is in the world. And at some point the restraint is removed and out of that emerges this person, this man of lawlessness. And the restraint, who is the restrainer? We said there's basically two notions that seem to have good justification in scripture. There's, there's a, we might call it a, a religious and a political aspect. And one, of course, is the presence of the church. Uh, many people speak of the Holy Spirit as a restrainer, but when they do that, they speak of the Holy Spirit's indwelling of the church. It's, it's the presence of God in the, the church, which is a witness to the truth. Remember that this man of lawlessness, um, he comes, <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 2.10 on your handout there, verse 10, it says, <clears throat> with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Verse 12, um, they who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness to testify to the truth. Our presence is a presence to testify to the truth that people may be saved. <laughs> and so that means that we participate in the restraining of the emergency <laughs> of this person. Doesn't mean we know who he is, but this is part of the function we don't just, we're not spectators. The point is we participate in this. And then on the political side, Romans 13 talked about the emperor and so on bears the sword in order to punish wickedness and evil. And people have said that there is this political governmental aspect to the restraining of this, but when that becomes corrupt, then this, this, this evil emerges more and more. And at some point, this person emerges who is the political power. And it's easy to think about Romans 13 as something that we are just, we're spectators, you know, I mean, it's us and them, who are them? They are the political power and it's us, you know, we're the, and so on. But we live in a polity created over 200 years ago in which the governing power is of the people, by the people, for the people. We participate in this. And what would, if we participate, that means we have a responsibility. And at the very least, it comes in terms of voting and election and so on. Our involved, we're not spectators. We're involved there. More and more people are pointing out, you've got to pay attention to who's coming into position in the various political offices, not just at the federal level, but at the local and state level. Christians have a responsibility and an, in, and an influence in who we support and put into power. And the, that presence, a presence of wisdom, uh, a presence 
and not of folly, but of, of wisdom, functioning at the various governor, governing levels here is important. It's an aspect of the restraint, the restraining of the emergence of evil. Well, we may have opportunity to say more about that next time, but I'm going to stop and because I promise I would do that and let you make comments, questions, observations. I'll take um, the PowerPoint off here for the sake of our Zoomers there. Comments, questions, observations on these things, on this man of lawlessness coming to this crisis point in the middle of the tribulation. Yes. My question is, where does the rapture fit in the picture you talked about today? Yes. Uh, the rapture occurs at the beginning of the day of the Lord. We believe that it occurs there. And the reason is because Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 that when the day comes, it will be... It will come with destruction for them, but for de with deliverance and salvation for you. And when he describes that in 1 Thessalonians 5, it seems to be what 1 Thessalonians 4 says, which is the rapture. So that's happening when the day begins. And that's when the man of lawlessness is revealed. So at the point of his revelation is the point of the rapture. And that also coordinates with the removal of restraint. Restraint. When I was in Israel on the way to the Temple Mount, because God pointed out that there was a, a stone in the intersection that was the cornerstone for the new temple. Mm -hmm. It kind of surprised me, but it was a big rock. Yeah. It was square. But he said that was that's the cornerstone that we're going to build the temple over. Well, have you, as you notice in Israel, they have a lot of stone. <laughs> I don't think they'll run short. So, uh, but yeah, to identify that and say, well, there, you know, that's what we're going to do. Um, you know, there, there are some people <clears throat> that are pretty advanced in their thinking and planning what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Barbara? So I've been wondering, what was, there aren't any signs for the rapture when it will occur, except perhaps, as you just pointed out here, that it's going to happen before the, the tribulation, before the day of the it happens in, as as I'm following Paul's language in 1 Thessalonians 5, it happens at the onset of the day of the Lord. If you think of the day of the Lord like a, a storm front, you know, that you know we're fine one day, but then you know this this front it, it hits. But when it hits, there's a separation of people. It says it comes with destruction on them, but deliverance for you. So I call it an onset day of, uh, of the Lord rapture, an onset rapture, or a pre-tribulational rapture. So, but he says it comes without warning. So there's no, no signs for that. All the signs that the scripture speaks of are signs to the descent of Christ, the appearing on the earth. And that's this tribulation sequence. But that begins coordinate with the, its beginning is coordinate with the rapture itself, from what I can see. What about the parable of the fig tree? Because when you, I'm thinking that's Israel coming back into the land yes. in 48. So it, and he says this generation will not pass. Yes, and, and there, there are several who have, have argued that from Matthew 24, that the lesson of the fig tree, that the fig tree was the, is a a symbol, a, a biblical symbol, a metaphor for Israel. So when he says fig tree, he means Israel. And the blooming would be the reconstitution of the nation. And that has been argued by many in the past. However, the problem with that is the parallel passage in Luke 
Jesus says, learn the lesson of the fig tree and all the trees. And what that tells you is he's not talking about a well-known metaphor. He's just using a botanical metaphor. And the botanical metaphor is when these things start, it moves on to completion, just like this time of year. I mean, the greening of the trees and the buds, you know, are beginning to appear. Well, when that bud appears, you know, we know how far it is to summer. When this, when this sequence appears, we're in a process that moves to its completion. And I think that's all he's saying. He's not talking about the reestablishment of Israel there, in my opinion. According to Mark Twain, there weren't any trees in Israel before the Jews came back. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Romans did cut a lot down. That's true, especially around Jerusalem. Uh, not all of them. And if you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, you can see a few, um, a few olives there are that olive trees that go back to that time, but many of them were cut down. That's true. Doug? So would it be correct that for now 2,000 years, every generation, Satan has had to have an antichrist and a false prophet waiting in the wings? Well, I think that if the Lord, and, and remember Jesus said, nobody knows but the Father. Satan doesn't know. No, nobody knows. You know, but when he says, then things, I mean, uh, whoever is on the scene, I believe, will take the part. It's as if somebody used this great metaphor one time. It's is like we've got this rehearsal that's been going on for 2,000 years. There's the stage, the stage of the world, and people are rehearsing the parts, and they they pass off and other people come and they rehearse and they pass off and other people. But as soon as somebody says the play starts, whoever is rehearsing at the time <laughs> takes that part. So I think that's a good way to look at it. But this person is not, once he appears, he comes with a power as in and is empowered beyond anybody that has appeared before. The problem for me is this, there's this momentum that shifts, you know, and it doesn't seem like the church has the momentum that it had. You know, and what to be tolerant now isn't just to understand the other person's position. It's almost like you have to agree with it. Yes. <laughs> They're pushing so hard for us to agree with everything they do. They're so different, so against, you know, Christian values. I, I find that, that very true, uh, Joe. And this, you know, I, I think about this, these last um, three verses here in 2 Thessalonians 2, mm -hmm. what we have on the sheet. They refused to love the truth. They did not believe the truth. Have you noticed how people are promoting things that are so obviously untrue? And um, yeah, and you're expected to believe it or you'd be punished. <coughs> things that are so obviously false. You know, this guy is a woman. Obviously false, <laughs> but we will punish you if you don't believe it. Yeah. And this is this is odd. This is different, and nothing like that has happened in history. And so, you divide the talk about the church losing its influence at the same time as falsehood gains in power in the culture and the society is something to be concerned about. The Lord could bring about a reversal. This could be just simply a swell of evil. So that's why we continue to, to testify to Christ, continue the ministry, and but it is concerning. 
found along that line. Um, as we were coming in to church today, for the first time in my life, I saw more than one Ukrainian flag. Mm -hmm. Huge mm -hmm. Ukrainian flag on top of a large office building. Now, typically we have at least demonstrably been neutral. Mm -hmm. We're not, but uh, in, I, I know there's a lot of people on both sides, but as, as my wise wife said, it, that's a recognition of one point. That's what they're they're moving us closer to is one world. And it's an opinion that everybody has to accept. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. There is this globalization uh, that we have to recognize. So when you're involved, I mean we as citizens, you have to be involved in the political process at the level to which we're involved as citizens. And the citizenry that our founders of this country envisioned were citizens who are informed and who are aware and able to make reasonable judgments. If we have people who are working on global agendas, there's more than one, but they are out there. Mark? One of the things I, I think about a lot is, and I think most people can relate to it, and my is that we grew up wondering how in the world the German people went along with it. How could that have happened? The staff yeah. under their nose that they went to, to work at the school and play and they saw it and knew it was happening. And yet, they didn't do that. You see that same thing today. I'm, I'm pretty active on social media, unfortunately, to show up with the time of the year because I am. But, I'm oftentimes surprised at other people who will send me private messages and they will say something like, Thank you for standing up on that point. Yeah. And of course, I always retort, Well, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. And they are very candid about saying they're fearful of doing it. Yeah. The fear that they'll lose friends, jobs, you name it. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking we've, we've just gotten to the point that Joe made. We've gotten to such a place that to voice disagreement, no matter how diplomatic you may be, uh, you become the enemy. Right? <coughs> You've lost this ability to talk about things and find common ground. It's really, really sad. So when I fast forward that, and people say, well, how could these things happen at the time of the tribulation? I think we're seeing examples of that today in our world. Yeah. Exactly how it happens. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Mark. Um, the point is when you lose uh, concern for truth, everything is power. Everything is politics. Everything is power. And the postmodern mind is that it's all just simply who has the greater power to cast the narrative. And everything that's opposing is not some objective truth. I mean, if there was, then we could say, well, we disagree about that. But, you know, hey, you know, your opinion, my opinion, but let's look at it. We can kind of objectively come to it. That's not where this is. This is a forced opinion. And so people are not sure what to do with the conflict. But as long as we have a voice, we need to use it. So thank you for those, those comments. Well, we are at the end of the time, and so let's do this. We, we have been, as we've been talking about this Antichrist, we've been looking at some of the, the other scripture that comes to bear upon it. So next week, let's just spend the time here on this point C on the outline here. What's the contribution coming from Revelation 13 and 17 to this that we've been talking about? And, um, and so we'll talk about that. Uh, next week, and you can think about things that we've said today, and there may be some other questions as well. So, all right, but well, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to, to come together and to read the scripture, to consider what you have revealed in your word. Lord, we acknowledge that you are the Lord. And when we see various forms of, of um, falsity and 
falsehood and wickedness in our world. Lord, we pray under the providence of God that, that you might raise up not only strong leadership in our nation that's principled and wise and moral and godly, but uh, that you would also strengthen us as your people to be a light for the truth in this world. Grant that many people might yet even turn from the darkness to come to know the Lord. We know that the time of restraint is a time of your mercy that people may come to know the Lord. But we also see that you will accomplish your purpose. And in that, you will bring your son back. And with him comes all that we have hope for in Christ. The fulfillment of the great promises of God and the everlasting kingdom. And so, Lord, we give thanks to you. We, we are confident in you as we go forth from here this day and this week. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.